So uh, this is where it all began for me in 1968. I went to France and I was in Paris and I was standing outside a tobacco store and I bought these, uh, they were selling these strips of color slides of castles and I bought a strip and I really liked the photographs um, in the, in, of, of these castles. So I bought a URL pass and I, and I traveled all over France and what I tried to do is I took my own camera and I tried to make photographs of these castles just like the ones, I tried to make photographs just like the ones that I, that I found outside the tobacco store. And, and when I got back and developed my own photographs, I guess for me, yeah, I like my own photographs, but I mean, for me, um, even though I like my own photographs, um, I kind of like theirs better. Uh, when I was 22, I, I, I used to make pottery. I used to teach pottery to high school kids. I did it for two years. I could throw. And, uh, but then after I, uh, I left the job, I, I didn't do it anymore. But when I had uh, kids years later, we used to go to this place called Color Me Mine. So, you, so, the, so the deal was you'd walk in, you'd pick out a plate, and uh, they would give you the ingredients, and you'd make a drawing on the plate, you'd leave it, and you'd come back a week later, and it would be fired. And uh, so the kids would be doing um, their thing, and I, and I just would sit there and do mine, um, sort of like, just, uh, so uh, this particular one, I just, on the back, kind of like, Gave it to John Dog. <clears throat> so in 1972-73, uh, I did these uh, pen, uh, these big, I used a big pen, and I made these um, pen drawings, these pen head drawings, and I call them the, uh, the dead heads, and I did about 25 of them, and uh, they had a lot of honesty and truth and a heart and soul in them. They had a lot of me, and uh, they, were about, uh, they were about myself. But when I moved to New York in 74, I brought them with me and put them away because I didn't, I put them away because I didn't really want to have anything to do with those things. But uh, now years later, I have the, the convenience of experience. And I also have the, uh, I also have the advantage and the ability to get out of my own way. Uh, in 1985, I wanted to draw something, but I didn't know what to draw. So um, I, I, I thought, well, cartoons are drawn, so why don't you start um, redrawing cartoons. So that's what I did. Um, I would just sort of um, I'd take a 6B pencil and, and, and a piece of Darsh uh, paper and um, pick my favorite cartoonists. And, and, and this particular uh, drawing, um, you know, the punchline says, any luck. Um, I guess you could call this topical, and uh, you know, I was. I guess that's. I guess what that means is, um, you know, nothing. Nothing ever really. Nothing. Um, nothing ever really changes. Are you uh, drinking again? Doesn't your health mean anything to you? Yes, it means something to drink to. So in 1986, I started uh, painting jokes, and it was a way to uh, get a little bit more autobiographical. And so I silk screened, this is one of the very first uh, joke paintings, and I silk screened it on black canvas, and it was sort of a way to, to, paint, to paint the joke to death. And I did it five times, I painted this joke five times. And uh, it's sort of a way to, to, uh, to, do, to do it so many times, it was sort of a, a way to laugh at death. Um, and so by the fifth time, um, I was kind of killing it. Oh, white, white man. 
I don't know what to do. My house is burned to the ground, my wife died, my car's been stolen, and the doctor says I gotta have a serious operation. Black man, what you kicking about? You white, ain't you? Um, I painted this painting, this uh, 1989, and um, one of the things I think about sometimes is uh, some of the, uh, the work does, that I've done, does it continue to have any relevance? Uh, does it mean anything? Uh, does it continue to have any meaning at all? Uh, and uh, I look at this and I, I say, yeah, well, uh, yeah, I could have painted, yeah, maybe I could have painted this yesterday. So I was asking myself about the ultimate test for success. Like when you create something, what if what you created was picked up by a company like Ravel and they made it into a model kit? Like in this case, Ed Big Daddy Roth's Beatnik Bandit. So I was thinking about my jokes the other day, like this one. I had a friend who was a clown. When he died, all his friends went to his funeral in one car. So I was thinking, what if Ravel authenticated all my jokes and put them into a model kit? Would that be better than having my jokes hang at places like MoMA, MoCA, LACMA? So, so I guess the question is, um, is it, are my jokes better in, in museums or, or are my jokes better with Ravel? And do I care and, and when should I care? So in um, <clears throat> 1988, I wanted to paint something that had already been painted. So I decided to paint car hoods. In the back of magazines, you can send away for car parts. And one of the parts you can send away for is hoods. You get them in the mail and they're fiberglass. But this hood is a real hood. It's a Ferrari. And someone had sent it to me, sent it to me after it had been in a race and it crashed and yeah. burned. So, so this hood isn't really about what gets painted. It's more about what's good and bad. And uh, I, I, you know, I keep thinking what's good and bad is like something like you know, sex and death. <clears throat> this is a uh, nineteen sixty six. 350 GT Ford Mustang and uh, I wanted to paint something obviously that's, you know I, I, I wanted to paint something that was obviously painted so I wanted to paint my car and I own this car but I don't really own a real one I own a clone and a clone is essentially a faithful reproduction of, a, of the original car and I wanted to paint 27 copies and call it 27 Mustangs Kind of like a herd of horses and so while i was painting them i was thinking of uh, warhol's shadow paintings so all i could think about when i was painting them was was shadows and clones so uh, sometimes <coughs> making making stuff just kind of happens and uh, so one day I walked into the body shop and uh, the guys were taking apart a, a couple of cars and, um, and when, when I walked in there were like four doors just sort of like on top of each other and it just sort of hit me that yeah, that was, that was the doors. And um, so that's, that's how sometimes work gets made. And, uh, and in this particular case, I always thought, um, after I did it, I always thought that, um, you know, the door, the second door from the left, um, the Impala, uh, was, was Jim Morrison. I don't know, I think it was back in 89, 90, when I drew my bunny skull. 
I didn't think about copywriting it because I drew it. Um, and in those days, uh, the idea of copywriting, it really, I didn't really know much about it. I didn't think about it much because I owned half a stereo. And so these days, <clears throat> I still have a similar attitude. I, back then I didn't know much about copyright and today <clears throat> I know even less about copyright. But when I look at this now, I think about that Henny Youngman joke, uh, one where he says, take my wife, please. So I guess the way I deal with copyright now is I do a variation of that Henny Youngman joke, where, I, where the variation, <clears throat> the, way, the way I tell it is, take my art, please. So I guess the way I deal with copyright now is, take my art, please. In 1990, I was staying in Rome, <clears throat> and I hooked up with this girl, Annie Ann, and we started a band, <clears throat> and we called it Black Bra. We played out in public twice at the same cafe, and both times in the audience was Gregory Corso, and I was pretty jacked up because Corso was a living link between the beats, the hippies, and the punks, and after I moved back from, uh, after I moved um, back to New York, Annie moved to Prague and changed her name to Joan Katz. And a couple of weeks ago, Joan sent me her black bra. And I wish I could send her mine, uh, but I have no idea where it is. It's probably, um, I probably left it back in Rome. Uh, this is Black Bra. Uh, black Bra is uh, right in the middle of this show that I'm doing called High Times. And uh, the dates of the show uh, start in 1949 and it ends in 2018. And Black Bra. Uh, Cuts high times right down. Um, it kind of divides the times right in the middle. Because um, Black Bra was done in 1990. Back in uh, 2001, when I was building my body shop, I decided to uh, side, use part of the siding of the building was, I, w I used um, some VCR tapes, almost like as insulation. But um, I remember I used uh, <coughs> a lot of the tapes that I used came from, from our own collection. And I remember my kids <coughs> getting really mad at me because <coughs> I used, um, some of their SpongeBob tapes, but what they really got mad at me is, is I used up, uh, I used a lot of their their uh, <clears throat> Rugrats uh, Rugrat tapes. So there's a lot of there's a lot of Rugrats in there. So this is um, part of the woods where I live, um, upstate, <coughs> and. Uh, I used to, uh, and I still do occasionally, come out and hang paintings out here on trees. And uh, <clears throat> years ago, I hung a big painting of, of uh, Woodstock. Um, Woodstock painting. But uh, it's kind of... <clears throat> You find two parallel trees and you put it up, but I don't know what happened. Uh, I guess a storm came through and... Kind of rained like it did that weekend. Um, I really don't know what this is. I really, uh, I don't have a name for it. I don't know how to describe it. I really don't know how to talk about it. 
But uh, these things have been here for about 10 years. I have about 14 of them that surround my body shop. And uh, I guess uh, sometimes you make things and you don't know what it is. And, uh, you know, I'm okay with that. I think it's okay to make something and you don't know what they are. Here comes my ride. So I'm gonna, so I'm gonna leave now and I'm gonna walk through this um, Dan Coleman skate ramp. They turned upside down and uh, walk underneath it uh, and get in my, uh, I'm getting that, uh, that helicopter and uh, that's going to be it. So this is uh, called a happy trail. Over the years, I've done a lot of uh, what I call question question paintings, uh, where I just ask <clears throat> a question, and and it's it's really about just um, <clears throat> information or or the sharing of information, um, uh, inside information. Um, it's it's a sort of a way of a, to communicate with someone. So uh, this question is, um, who is in all three of these bands, the King Bees, Manish Boys, the Lower Third. Was it <clears throat> Mark Boland, Nick Cave, Slim Whitman, David Bowie, Skip Spence? Um, one thing I know is that I'm a big fan of uh, Raymond Pettibone, and I know that I know that he would know one of the answers is not Slim Whitman. I was a big uh, fan of Jimmy Pearsall growing up. He was uh, played for the Boston Red Sox. Um, I used to watch him in Fenway Park, and when I was about eight, I saw him hit a home run. He went to, and uh, he went to third base after he hit it, then the second, first, and came home. So he ran around the, the bases backwards, and I really liked that. That really impressed me. And uh, but he was really crazy, and so they made a movie based on his craziness called uh, Fear Strikes Out. And so I made this piece uh, with my baseball card collection of him, uh, and I combined it with a uh, canceled check from uh, Timothy Leary. Um, it was made out to Timothy Leary from his friend Richard Albert, um, and it was um, from, a, uh, from the Freedom Center Incorporated uh, business check. Uh, can you pass the acid test? So when I was 16, I, uh, I, I really liked Pollock. And so about uh, seven years ago, I started doing, I, I did this body of work called Covering Pollock, where I took photographs, mostly by Hans Namath, and, and I just started covering him with stuff, and, and I would make some collages. And uh, this one here, um, I, I, I added a, a, a guitar. And, uh, but anyway, um, recently I found a uh, canceled check by Pollock, which, which, which was um, pretty interesting. I had never seen one before, and I was really excited about, about it. And uh, this one happened to be um, also made out to the Internal Revenue Service. So I thought, you know, like, today might, might, be, a, um, might be a good day for Trump to return, to uh, let out his tax returns. Uh, 1969. Uh, I was 19 turning 20, went to Framingham, Massachusetts to see Jimi Hendrix uh, in a, a carousel theater in the round. And I uh, got up close uh, with my camera and took these pictures of Jimi. And uh, 
from the strip of negatives. I, I, this is the one I picked out. Um, and uh, later, um, when I started working with, with checks, I realized you could uh, go online and, and um, buy customized checks. So that's what I did. And uh, I, put, uh, I put the two things that they are essentially like 40 years apart together in the same frame. And uh, yeah, so. Kind of purple haze. <clears throat> um, I, I really don't see myself as a, a, a political artist. Um, I really don't. Um, I really don't like politics. Um, I don't really trust politics. Um, this one says, um, men and women, men and men, women and women. And, uh, but if you look up the definition of politics uh, in the dictionary, what it says is uh, politics is the infinite number of relationships between men and women. So if you want to make art, don't. Uh, this is uh, a real crazy speedboat that I uh, got on eBay. Um, not sure what I'm doing with it. I've had it sitting here for about four years. Um, not sure about the paint job, but it has its own pedestal, which I like, and I like the upholstery. The only contribution so far I've made is uh, I've managed to go out and find the smallest, tiniest um, outboard motor um, because it originally came with this huge, giant Evinrude uh, motor, and uh, and and this little thing is uh, this little this little outboard motor is called the Sea King. And my only question is, if if, if I put this out on the lake, um, will I get? Uh, do you get seasick if you put this out on a lake? Uh, this past weekend was the uh, <clears throat> anniversary of Woodstock. And I actually went to Woodstock uh, when I was 18. I didn't know what I was getting myself into. I, but the only reason why I went, I went with some of my friends. We went to see Jimi Hendrix. Uh, but anyway, we, uh, uh, later I, I bought these, um, a little while ago, I bought these, these pants. Um, that are uh, they were made based on a, a photograph of the, of the crowd at Woodstock, and um, I put them on the floor. And, and and when I was walking by today, I I, I looked down and I thought about that expression, you know, never never trust a hippie, which I've never really understood. But, um, I've always I've always um, I've always I don't see any reason why not to trust a hippie. So there's a bunch of things going on here. Um, <clears throat> when I was growing up, my father made me uh, take Morse code lessons uh, because he was a uh, ham radio operator. And later when I became an artist, one of the ways in which I defined art was art is the Coke bottle in the movie on the beach. Well, you have to watch the movie because the Coke bottle is, is, is caught on a lampshade and is accidentally touching uh, the Morse code uh, key and sending out uh, this gibberish, this Morse code gibberish. So I went out and bought a bunch of um, uh, harmonica holders recently, and instead of putting a harmonica in it, I, I put a Coke bottle in it, and um, I call this piece uh, Da Did Did It Did It Da Did Da Did It Did Da Did. This piece is called SOS, and it's about painting yourself into a corner. And in this case, the corner is the Bermuda Triangle, where a lot of planes and, and boats have disappeared into over the years and have never been heard from since. And so what I've done here is I've carved the exact coordinates of the Bermuda Triangle 
into this globe? And so the other question I'm asking <clears throat> is the idea of rescue. If I paint myself into this corner, do I even, uh, do I even want to be rescued? This is a Keith Richards haircut, and I made this wig back in 2007. Can't play Gimme Shelter, so I'll play my own song, loud song. Apologies to Keith. This is called Jawbone, and it's, uh, the title is based on a song by the band. And Robbie Robinson uh, sent me this guitar neck in the mail. It's a guitar neck that he designed. And I, one day I put it in, in one of my painting shoes and laced it up. So uh, after I did that, I had it cast. I had the whole thing cast in bronze, painted bronze, so everything is painted bronze. And I think uh, the thing that gives this sculpture a little bit more octane is I added, added this uh, boot polish, this little jar of boot polish, which is also uh, painted bronze. Just a little bit more additive. Um, they say a bibliophile is someone who likes books more than people. Um, so I guess, uh, yeah, I, you could call me a, a, yeah, maybe you could call me a bibliophile. I don't know. Um, anyway, uh, my friend John McQuinney uh, and I published uh, Ketra Narai, a novel by um, J.D. Salinger, but uh, when we were published it, we just changed uh, the name to a novel by Richard Prince. And when I told my daughter that she should read it, um, she actually, um, this is, she actually, uh, I gave her this copy and, and she actually read the book. Uh, she actually read Catcher in the Rye by uh, Richard Prince. This is one of my uh, stupidest ideas. Um, I wanted my own drink, but I wanted my own real drink. So I went to a real drink making company, Arizona Iced Tea, and I convinced them uh, to come out with, with this uh, product. And uh, I wanted to name it My Lemon. But after all the taste testing, uh, when I went back, they, they named it lemon fizz and um i was i got really upset and i said you know th this thing really uh i can't you know it, it it's it's you made it stupider so um i stopped talking to them and, and they sent me all these they sent me crates of this stuff and um i don't know it really did become uh, lemon fizz Would it be possible for me to make a populist piece of art? That was the question. So I'm a big fan of Seinfeld. And one evening I was watching Seinfeld and I realized, you know, Jerry has a lot of girlfriends. So I did some research and I realized over the course of the shows, he had about 57 girlfriends. So I asked my friend David Lazary at Two Palms Press to take all 57 girlfriends and mash them up 
uh, using that Nancy Burson late 70s, early 80s technology. And this is the girlfriend that came out. It came out very Richter-esque. And the other idea was to take, uh, blow them up on canvas, 57 canvases, and take them down to Miami Beach, uh, to the art fair. And I thought, this is what would sell. This is what people would want. This is what people would buy. But I was completely wrong. It was a complete failure. I sold only one. So it was sort of like, good luck with that. So it's been about four and a half years <clears throat> since I started the Instagram portraits. And all they ever really wanted to be was a simple portrait. But in the last year and a half, they've, they've landed me, the aesthetic of them has, has, has landed me on Deposition Row. And they've become an enormous immense from the get-go. Um, an enormous immense from the get-go and, uh, and in an ouch, zero mess. About seven years ago, a friend of mine, Bob Rubin, gave me an 8x10 black and white glossy of Jackie Gleason and Bob Hope and this chimpanzee playing golf. He also gave me some memorabilia belonging to Bob Hope these two liquor decanters. And he asked me to do something with them. And what I did was make a photo mill. And a photo mill is a cutting edge way of dealing with photography. But when I look at this, I can't even describe it, I can't name it, I don't even know what I'm doing. But I guess the, the only way I can talk about it is, um, <clears throat> The only way I can talk about it is, if you want to make art, don't. So, uh, when I was a teenager, I, I really liked looking at the magazine Playboy. I really liked the jokes, the cartoons, the pictures of the naked girls and the interviews. And so I made, uh, I took this centerfold from 1962. I would have been, I probably would have been about 12 at the time. And I took this centerfold um, and made a photo mill uh, out of it. And a photo mill um, is, a, is a, a way of dealing with a, a new cutting, cutting edge way of dealing with photography. Uh, it sort of has a 3D process to it. So this centerfold has had a golf theme. And so I, I I chose some, I, I picked out some golf memorabilia and, and put it, you know, you literally can put it in the photograph. So I'm thinking like, you know, this, this would be, this is something that you would take down to your basement and hang in your play, in your playroom and hang it next to a, a, a Leroy Neiman. Moby Grape, <clears throat> Skip Spence, 1967. San Francisco. Bob Dylan, Heaven's Gates. The Diggers, Richard Brodigan. Trout Fishing in America. Night Duty Nurse. Well, uh, one of my favorite things to do is to try to find the original illustration that, that goes Onto the uh, that was used for the uh, the paperback, 
and then uh, put put the two together in in the same frame. I really love. I really like to do that. I really enjoy it. Um, and uh, once I put it in my frame, I I uh, I can call it art. And but you know, you know, there, there are, some say you know you can't do that, but. I don't know. I don't really. I don't really listen. I don't know. I don't really care about the sun say. One of the first uh, pieces of art I ever bought by another artist was uh, this drawing by Robert Smithson. I bought it off of John Weber um, uh, years ago, like forty years ago. Um, Anyway, what, what a lot of people are, what a lot of art historians and critics don't really understand or get or even mention or even talk about with Smithson's work, especially with the Spiral Jetty, is, is the amount of science fiction that's, that's part of the work. They don't like to talk about that. So I was always thinking that when, uh, but I know Smithson um, loved science fiction, um, painted science fiction uh, in his early paintings, and I was wondering when he was doing the Spiral Jetty, was... Uh, I was always wondering whether or not he was, uh, that Smithson might have been thinking about the, uh, the, uh, the first uh, interracial kiss between Captain Kirk and Lieutenant Yahura. This is uh, <clears throat> an Erez Fisher. Uh, it's called The Last Supper. And uh, I remember when I first saw it, I thought it was made out of clay. Um, but then I went over and I tapped on it and it was, and it was cast. Uh, bronze and <clears throat> um, I'd met Urs years ago in, in, in Venice and had been following his work and, and the one thing that, that got me about this particular piece is that I had heard that <clears throat> um, that uh, he uh, puts out a real lavish, lavish lunch for all his assistants in his studio um, when he's working in his studio so I thought you know like yeah, it, this was a real, uh, it, it was a way I connected with this uh, particular work um, because it felt, you know, there was a reality to it. <clears throat> so this is a, a Frank Stella uh, that I have um, up, up here in, um, up behind the Catskills, the end of a dead end dirt road. And um, <clears throat> I remember seeing, I, I really like Frank Stella's work a lot. <clears throat> and I remember seeing him when I was really young in a, in a, in a uh, <clears throat> movie called Painter's Painting. And the way he explained the reason, um, <clears throat> uh, one of the reasons why he was, the, the, uh, the stripes on his black paintings were, were, were three inches, was that um, he was using a three inch brush. And um, I remember, uh, that kind of, I made some sort of connection with that reasoning. I thought that was um, pretty pretty good way to put it. So back in um, 2003, 2004, Kim Gordon, who, I, who I've known since the late 70s, asked me to do their album. And uh, she asked me to, for one of my nurse paintings. So after it came out, I, came, I gave the band a, a snare drum uh, and had him ask him to sign it. Uh, I got it signed by Kim Thurston and Lee. But uh, Steve wasn't around, so um, later uh, I signed Steve's name myself. So 75% uh, of it, I guess, is real. Um, I want to hang it up in, in my office and uh, put it in a frame and look at it. And it would be kind of like a, a golden hits kind of thing, something that hits gold. So uh, this is a, a painting by <clears throat> Bob Dylan. It's called My Way. And um, I know there's rumors out there, but um, believe me, um, you know, I, I've been to his studio and um, it, it's, uh, it's really, uh, you know, he's the one who's, who's really painting these paintings. Um, and uh, when I went to his studio, 
what really uh, struck me um, about the way he was working was like um, it was like he was like he was in a uh, witness protection program. This is a. Uh, this is what happens when you don't throw things away. This is a, an old hippie drawing that I did in 1998 on a, a large piece of rock canvas. And a couple of years ago, I had that piece of canvas sent out to my studio and I used the canvas as a drop cloth. And at the end of the summer, I started cutting up the, the drop cloth <clears throat> to throw away. But when I got to this part, I didn't throw it away. I sent it away. And this came back um, this afternoon. And, uh, you know, like, um, I'm so glad. I'm, I'm so glad. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad that I didn't trash it. Uh, Q-Tip came to my studio a couple of years ago and asked me to, if I wanted to do his album cover uh, for a Tribe Called Quest. They hadn't put on an album in 18 years, and I was excited. And, um, but he asked me, could I uh, do something um, with a hippie drawing? And uh, I was really surprised because I didn't know. Um, I said, you know, I wasn't sure how he, how he knew about the hippie drawings. But he did, and... Uh, so I did a bunch of uh, drawings, and this is the one they picked out. Um, put it on the album cover, and this is the gold record. And uh, you know, I, I even uh, got presented to me from Q-Tip and Epic Records, and uh, now uh, the whole thing's turned into uh, High Times. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, this is, this is how you paint. These are called the High Times paintings and they grew out of a body of work that I did in the late 90s called the, uh, the Hippie Drawings. They're honest, they're real, they're true. And those are, those are emotions that I haven't had much to do with in the last 50 years. So when I look at them, um, I look at them and I, and I feel, this is what I was born to do. And I also think about that lyric, he not busy being born, is busy dying. So that's what I'm doing. I'm busy being born and I'm busy dying. I was never beat. I was never a hippie. I was never a punk. Not house, never house. I was never hip hop. There was never no wave. There was never techno. There was never any of these things. Maybe being an artist is, um, you know, maybe it's just being everything. High times. Brand new. Um, art Forum, no. Art in America, no. Art News, no. Art Review, no. Uh, freeze, forget it. Freeze is like, you know. 
Um, what's that German magazine? Textkunst? Or that stupid... You know, you can't even, like, understand... can't even hardly understand the advertisements. But High Times... <clears throat> at least I got High Times. Right? Right. How many coffees? 10,000. 10,000! 10, High Times. A brand new... High times. How many copies did we get? 10,000. No, we didn't get 10,000 copies, right? We got how many copies? 10,000. 10, no, we didn't get 10,000. How many copies did we get? We did. Seriously? Yeah. 10? Thousand. We have a hundred boxes. We have 10,000 copies of this stupid thing? Yeah. Of this magazine? Yep. Dope. Uh, hey, you want a copy of High Times? <laughs> hey, guys. Guys, you want a copy of High Times? High Times. Um, uh, you know what? Maybe they wanted. Um, maybe they wanted a copy of Lifestyles. Um, they didn't want a copy of. They didn't want a copy of High Times. I just fell in the shower and I and I tried to grab the water. Hey, I went to the psychiatrist the other day. And I told him I was depressed and he said, why? I said, Trump. And he said, stop your whining and shoot the shit. And I said, oh, I thought that's what we were doing. I'd like to smoke Trump even though it would probably turn into a fucking bummer. So I've had this place called the Second House, and it burned down. A pan of cat skills I have it, and it burned down. I got hit by lightning about ten years ago, and uh, we're going to replace it with a greenhouse this time. Uh, and in it, we're going to uh, put in the greenhouse. We're going to put these uh, tire planters. We're going to put about eight of them full of dirt. And when New York State um, legalizes marijuana, we're going to replant the tire planters with a uh, with a pot plant, and we're going to make it into a tribute house. And the tribute's going to be the 
the tribute's going to be to uh, Allen Ginsberg. Because Allen and I used to live in the same apartment building on 12th and Avenue A in the late 70s. And I'm also going to uh, hang this uh, poster of Allen that I had hanging in my bedroom. So it's, I mean, I had it when I was a teenager. And in the poster, he has a sign hanging around the, his neck. And on the sign, it says, the, it says the Pope smokes dope. Sometimes, uh, this is what I love about New York. Um, I just walked out of my studio and um, this baguette was um, on this, uh, I guess it's a storm drain. And um, kind of, it's right across it's right across the street from um, this post office um, on 124th Street. And um, this post office is where the, um, it's closed now, but it's where the son of Sam used to work. <laughs> 